in this edition of Fifth Gear, BMW's exciting new Z4 Roadster, the Ford Fusion, what's it for, and our complete guide to roadside cameras, and the latest civilian version of the all-conquering Hummer. A couple of weeks ago, we showed you next year's crucial new cars at the Paris show. But we're not going to miss out on some serious tyre kicking when we've got our own little motor show, and it's on right now. And you can start with me and an unashamed bit of flag waving. MG Rover have thrown off their humble shackles and have hit us with both barrels. When you come to the show, you have got to come and be stunned by this, the X-Power SV. This is not just some body kit bolt together, but a 200 mile an hour rear wheel drive V8 coupe. What you see here will cost around £85,000. And if you're still not tempted to trade in the 911 Turbo, then wait for the 965 horsepower nitrous oxide version. In the meantime, listen to this. Over at TVR, they had a launch to shout about too. Literally, because the microphone had backed up. Just as well that the new car could do all the talking for them. The T350 has a Tamora chassis, a Tamora interior, a Tamora engine and a funky body. The first day it was shown they took a shed full of orders, but there are other British sports cars that may take your fancy. One not to miss is the return of the name Invicta. Now, that hasn't been on a sports car for 50 years, but it's back here and now with a big, powerful V8 engine in the front. It's very wide, isn't it? Well, it is, Tiff, but it's also the first car in the world to have a one-piece carbon fibre body shell. Production should start next year. Back to you, Needles. Janetta is another fun car. It's a real die-hard enthusiast car, but uh, I can't help feeling them battling against it always, but it's great to see them back as well. But, of course, one real success story in the British sports car industry has been the Noble, the M12. It's an inspiration to all that hope to build cars and uh, to make the show a bit more different. They've chopped the roof off one, just to be different. It's nice, looks good. And if you thought you'd seen the last of Marcos, you haven't, because they're here as well. In fact, the place is full of sports cars. Here's three for the mums. Think trendy, think dinky with the Ford streetcar. Or perhaps you prefer the turbocharged smart roadster. Or if the retro look is your cup of tea, then jump into the Daihatsu Copen. Me, I hate soft tops. I recommend mulling over the understated call of the Audi S4. 344 horsepower will frighten an M3, but will it be as fun to drive? Then there's the new Volvo S60R, the most powerful Volvo ever, with an active suspension that adjusts 500 times a second. And don't forget the new all-aluminium Jaguar XJ. Before deciding what you really want is £104,000 worth of Aston Martin DB7 GT. Yes, please. If you lose the kids, then head for the Subaru stand. They're bound to be discussing headlamps and spoilers in the lee of the nearest Impreza. Or you might just find them drooling over the Alpha 147 GTA. A 3.2 litre V6 and 250 horsepower and sultry looks. And I want one in red. Thanks. <laughs> no, nope, nothing in there. Every party has its pooper, and this year it's booze and hisses to BMW, who couldn't be bothered to turn up. But if you lot keep buying their cars in droves anyway, why should they spend millions building a temporary stand in an orange-lit cow shed? But it's a shame, because it means you won't get the chance to see the Z4 up close. So, if Mohammed won't come to the mountain, we'll send Vicky to meet Mohammed. Every litter has a runt, and the Z3 was BMW's. Don't get me wrong, it was a massive sales hit, and the M version was lovely. But the lesser models were positively puny compared to their rivals. They were nothing more than pretty cars for not-so-pretty people, called Tony and Guy. 
So here I am in some five-star sunshine haven on the edge of the Atlantic with the keys to what promises to be everything the Z3 wasn't, the Z4. BMW say it is an engineering triumph, the B-Road's best buddy, the Boxster beater. What they didn't mention is that it looks nothing like your typical BM. It's a mishmash of every conceivable angle, curve and straight line known to the naked eye. And just now, I'm too flabbergasted to tell you whether I actually like it. But hey, it's sunny, it's 26 degrees, it's October, and I've got six hours left to find out whether this is a proper sports car. Looks aren't my top priority. Getting into a Z4 will be more expensive than ever, but it's for the better. On paper, at least, BMW mean business. There are no impotent four-cylinder engines. It'll come with either a 2.5 straight six that's priced against Audi's TT Roadster and Honda's S2000, or there's this, the 231 BHP 3-litre, which at roughly 31 grand is firmly in Porsche Boxster territory. So, where's your money going? Well, the Z3 was a bit like Cher, a pretty face on an antique chassis. And this Z4 cannot afford to moan and creak like the Rolling Stones. So, it uses a stock current 3 Series as its backbone, with lots of techno wizardry thrown into the mix. And good grief, it's quick. 0-62 takes 5.9 seconds, which is half a second quicker than the standard Boxster, and it'll steam on to 155. It sounds really fruity. But what's even more striking is the ride, considering it is a pretty firm setup and that your derriere is sitting almost over the back axle. It is eerily smooth. As well as the usual ABS, AST, A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z, BMW have added yet another acronym, DDC, Dynamic Drive Control, which, at the press of a button, beefs up the steering and sharpens the throttle. Now, why they couldn't have put that all as part and parcel of the car to start with, I have no idea. Too many driver aids do my head in. This is a sports car. You are supposed to feel what's going on, not press buttons. That said, it is still quite fun to drive. And the interior's not bad either. Just like the outside, it is very un-BMW. Gone are the retro trademarks and pokiness of the Z3 to be replaced by Teutonic efficiency. Big dials, big stereo, small steering wheel. Opt for the metal finish and it all looks clinically cool. Satellite navigation, sports leather seats and the essential wind deflector are all options. But thankfully, the electric roof comes for free. So this bigger, more expensive Z4 is a world away from the Z3. It's quicker than a Boxster and as well built as an Audi TT. The only disappointment is that with all those driver aids, it's not as much fun for a purist as Honda's S2000. On Britain's wet roads though, the BM will be less of a handful. But the burning question still remains, do I like the look of it? From my angle, Tony and Guy won't like it because it doesn't conform to the norm. Which is precisely why I find it exceptionally appealing. Right, back to the motor show and the Bentley Continental GT. Now, I saw this big Bentley in the Paris show and I wasn't sure I liked it, especially that bulbous front end. I saw it uh, at the UK launch and I hated it, but actually it's growing on me. It can't be like an Aston DB7 or an XK8 because it's not supposed to be slinky because it's a Bentley. I can't believe you both didn't like it. I mean, this is a Bentley without corners. I mean, normally I don't like Bentleys, but this is a, a purposeful vehicle. It looks fast. But the lines are a bit confusing from different angles. Yeah, but... It's just big, bulky and chunky and it's yummy. And apparently it's supposed to be a four-seater. That's never a four-seater. Yeah, yeah. I don't think so. So how is it? Are you still talking about legroom and shoulder on? <laughs> Look, it matters. If they claim it's a four-seater, it should seat four. I but agree to. I driving agree. position, fantastic. 
So 180 miles an hour plus is not enough to interest you? I'm I've got to have exactly it. the right shoulder on. I'm getting the feel of it. So, did you spend 110 grand on it? No, I haven't got 110 grand. You lie. Quentin, would you spend the money on it? Um, with a little shade of discount, yes. Yeah. Oh, it's cool. 180 miles an hour plus Victoria. I and, know. It's, and it's residual value. Mm. No, I predict that for the next six months, this car will change hands for 50 grand more than a list. On all the two, then. Better than shares. We're really. all agreed. This car is bitching. Whatever bitching means, though I think he's probably referring to the twin turbocharged six litre that produces more than 500 horsepower. So, the Porsche KN. Prices will range from 44 to 68,000 pounds, but we're still not sure about those controversial looks. Go to the show and decide for yourself. Then, check out its sister. It's made by Volkswagen and it's called the Two Twin. Oh, it's called that. Anyway, it comes in lots of different types of engines, but two in particular stick out. A W12 petrol and a V10 diesel that's got 750 newton metres of torque. And whilst you're here, check out the Golf R32. It's a super GTI, and it looks pretty cool to me. These are the headline facts. A 3.2 litre V6, 240 brake horsepower and £22,000. Only 700 will be coming to the UK. Now, the big irony about motor shows is that they're a static celebration of things that are designed to move. Well, the new Mini has put paid to all that. The amazing Russ Swift will be handbrake turning all day, every day, till the show closes on November the 3rd. We couldn't resist joining in the fun. Come on then, keep up. This is the big finale. OK, here we go, everybody. Two wheels. Three, two, one. <laughs> Ever so simple, all in the wrist action, you know. Ford have just launched this, the Fusion, which I discovered was a UAV. And I'm thinking, cool, urban assault vehicle, rocket launchers, armour plating, all wrapped up in this stealth package. Genius. And then uh, someone told me it stood for urban activity vehicle. Ford would like you to think the Fusion gives you the agility and economy of a Super Mini, the practicality of a small MPV and the commanding style of an off-roader, all under one roof. For me, urban activities are split into mugging and shopping, so I'm guessing that this must be a shopping car. Now, Ford have cleverly designed it around your average eight-foot male by raising the Fiesta roofline, so inside it feels massive, especially if you're a kid. Plus, it's got a wanging great boot. It comes with three trim levels, the Fusion 1, 2 and 3. This is the tube, so it's got a leather steering wheel, CD player and air conditioning as standard. Now, I could knock the dashboard for being a bit plain and grey, but it's well stuck together and anyway, this is a means to an end type of car. Plus, it's got the odd handy MPV-like cubbyhole, the half-chewed chicken drumsticks when you've tucked into the shopping on the way home from the supermarket. We all do it. The Fusion is nearly as good to drive as the Fiesta, which is saying something, because that little Ford has class-leading handling abilities. OK, this one's a bit more roly-poly and bends, but you can live with it. At the same time, it's got a very grown-up gear change and a good range of engines, a 1.4-litre diesel or a 1.4 or 1.6-litre petrol. This slightly raised driving position isn't quite enough to appeal to those wannabe off-road drivers. In fact, it's just like sitting on a big cushion in a Fiesta. Having said that, though, the good all-round visibility and its tiny dimensions make it a damn sight easier to park on a 4x4 or an MPV. The Fusion is on sale now, priced just shy of 10 grand for the basic entry level, up to 11,995 for the 1.6 Fusion 3. Compared to its latest Super Mini rivals, the Honda Jazz and Citroen C3, it's slightly more expensive, but not by much. As a Super Mini with MPV practicality, the Fusion works quite well. But if Ford are trying to pump up its image as a rugged 4x4, it's not really having it. It's not tough, it's not trendy, 
In fact, it lacks any interesting detail. It looks spoddish, and nobody likes a geek. So we tried a few things to make the looks of the fusion fuse. We added bits of jungle-like camouflage, but it didn't do anything for its image as an off-roader. And a few max power mods didn't help it cut it as an urban street fighter either. We even tried adding some colour to this dreary shape, but no matter how spectacular my painting skills, no matter how nifty my brushwork, the dullness just shone through. you into a secret. UAVs already exist because there are plenty of small, practical, easy to drive cars currently on sale. And the Fusion should be amongst the best of them on all counts. Buy it for those reasons and you'll be laughing. But don't let the advertising spin fool you into thinking you've got something different. Ever felt you're being watched? No matter where you are, there's a camera monitoring your every move. But what do they all do? Well, I'll tell you. I spy with my little eye something beginning with... T for Traffic Master. And it looks like this. Or this. Or these. Or that. Now, everybody thinks that they are speed cameras, but do not panic. They are merely monitoring the flow of traffic for the Traffic Master network and beaming down information about jams to units like this. Traffic Master, traffic flowing freely. I know. I can see. Here's a relatively new one, S for Stingray. It magically reads your number plate day or night to hunt down road tax cheats. It's linked into the DVLA database and so far has digitally captured 21,000 offenders. Now, talking of surveillance, there are hundreds of CCTV cameras watching our motorways for jams, accidents and breakdowns. Fibre optics connect them to a central nerve centre, and although they don't measure speed, if you look like you're setting a lap record, they can soon alert a police car in your vicinity. Keen-eyed viewers will want to know what the black box is on the side. Well, it's part of the number plate recognition system. They monitor every registration that drives by, automatically cross-referencing it with the police national computer and thereby instantly spotting stolen cars. G for Gatso. I'm sure you all know that it was invented by a Dutch rally driver. And I'm sure you all know only about one in four flashes results in a conviction. But lots of people think only a yellow camera can convict you. Well, the validity of the offence is not affected by the colour of the camera, my lord. Quite simply, if you're caught by a yellow camera, then a percentage of the fine goes to the police. If you're caught by a grey one, then the whole lot goes to the Treasury. Now, I spy with my little eye something beginning with... Ah, oh, for RLC 36, of course. It's a baby gat so that only flashes when a car runs a red light. It doesn't measure speed at all. T is for true below. Everyone thinks that these are infrared, but they're not. The purple colouring is just to stop you being blinded by the flash. This one is a striking yellow, but they also come in a very fetching blue. There are around 300 in the UK. They take a picture of the front of the car, and so a mugshot of the driver too. They don't use radar like a Gatso, but are hooked up to wires buried in the road that detect if you're over the limit. S for specs, the digital future. They're on all the time and they don't just measure your speed at a fixed point, like a Gatso or a Truvelo, but over a distance. So slowing down just under the camera won't get you off the hook. You've got to be beady-eyed to spot them as well. These ones on the M6 have a small yellow plate behind them. You've got to be on your guard or you could easily miss them. D is for DS3. Now, you've probably noticed lines on the road like this before and never paid them too much attention. Well, if they have got a grey box on the roadside next to them, then they are a mobile speed camera site. And the police can scuttle along at any time, plug themselves into this kit and merrily snap away speeding motorists. You have been warned. 
Keep an eye out for transit vans parked in laybys too. They don't, as the signs suggest, contain laughing policemen, but the last tech laser gun system. Even with all these markings, you'd be amazed at how many people zoomed past at naughty speeds. Not me though. Well, that time anyway. Mind you, it's not just transits you need to look for. In Holland, they're even sneakier. Yes, it looks like a humble wheelie bin, but you'd be wise not to go racing on dustbin day because they've started putting speed cameras inside. Now that's cheeky and rubbish. Well, hopefully that's told you all you need to know about roadside cameras. Now, I'm never one to let an opportunity go by, so if uh, you'll excuse me for a moment. <laughs> Sound effect tapes. Don't you just love them? This is the Hummer H2, the latest civilian version of the military Hummer. It is smaller than the original, but it's still absolutely huge. Unless, of course, you're an American. And that becomes even more apparent when you go to get in. There you Obviously designed to bear a strong resemblance to the original, at a distance you'd be hard pushed to tell the difference and just as worried if you saw it charging towards you. It seems to have a few more straight edges than the original, but the front end, the steep sloping windscreen and the narrow windows make no secret to the fact that the two are related. It's on the inside, though, that everything changes. The old Hummer was ridiculous, with a huge transmission tunnel dominating the centre, leaving room for just four seats in each corner. Now we have all the luxury and accommodation of a modern-day family car. You know, I so wanted to mock this as another example of pointless American excess. But I'm actually beginning to quite like it. The 316-horsepower petrol V8 provides an impressive surge of acceleration, hauling the three-tonne Hummer to 60 in 10 seconds. The steering is surprisingly positive, and tarmac corners can be taken in style. But none of that speed stuff really matters. This car can cross a river, climb a wall, or drive over large obstacles without breaking into a sweat. This could be the most accomplished off-roader ever, but will that be enough to appeal to American SUV owners? Americans bored with their sports utility vehicles and not wanting to buy a European off-roader are going to love these, especially as you can now buy a Hummer for $49,000. Mind you, you might want a few extras, like the sixth seat, a mount to put this huge spare wheel on the back, and some steps to help you climb aboard. At first, it feels like you're driving something the size of a London bus, but you soon get used to it, and you certainly get a lot of respect when you want to change lanes. One thing you don't want to do, though, is check your fuel consumption. But then, who cares about fuel consumption in America? If you want an H2 in the UK, you'll have to import one yourself, because at the moment, GM are only aiming at the North American market, where, priced at less than a Range Rover or Toyota Land Cruiser, it's just got to be a huge success, whichever way you look at it. You know, if the Needells were ever to move to America, I'd think very seriously about trading in the family M-Class for a Hummer H2.